in association with Get a Tax Rebate, 1895 Sports, Mesa Vienna Aesthetics, CDX Security. Okay, welcome to another episode of the Oddball Woody Show. Where today we've got a, a great guest because it's a great success story from young rugby league player who aspired to play a professional rugby, went on to pursue his dream, then went on to work into the welfare side of things within rugby league and now is the current Warrington Wolves CEO. So there's a great story behind behind this guy. He's also Scotland's nemesis because he represented <laughs> Ireland at rugby. Uh, those un- uncompromising performances he put on in the field. That's true, yeah, that's right. That's right, that would it. <laughs> uh, but th- and th- this is what we'll touch more on as well because I think sometimes people forget that you had a you know a decent rugby league career as well. You average, know. average, as an average player at best, I think. It was a bit better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit better than average. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, and, and again, I think it's a it's a great success story to to where you, you've gone, so welcome Carl. Thanks Paul, thanks for having me. And, uh, I think you're doing a great job, I've, obviously we've got a good relationship and I've kept an eye on what you've done pre, uh, Paul's playing and do you know what, it's impressive that uh, you mean, you're doing these different kind of things and your podcast has been has been great mate, so well done. Cheers, thanks for that. Uh, and again, it's great to have you on because you know it's, a, it's an interesting story and I know you know, this will just be a, a, a usual chat that, that we have, but uh, for everybody else, it'd be interesting to know a little bit about your background and, and where you've come from. Yes, yeah, so, uh, as you know, I'm born, born and bred in, in Wigan. Uh, do you mean I come from a family that have a lot of love with some real good values in terms of working hard? I have two older siblings, that sister's, what, 10, 11 years older than myself, and brother's nine years older than me, so I uh, got bashed around a little bit as a kid and used to play in the street with my brother and uh, his friends were a lot older than myself uh, and sport mad sport mad whether that was football cricket tennis just into all sports and obviously rugby uh coming from wigan it wasn't you know what i mean if if you're going to play rugby it's, it's when uh and then my dad took me down to tinley giants when i was what about six six years of age and that started me loving and the pa- passion for the sport and as a massive wigan fan Growing up, uh, I still remember getting the, the jerseys out the bottom of my drawer, going down to Wembley and okay, pulling that jersey out and filling the cotton with the, the JJB on the front of it and uh, the number on the back. And at the time, they didn't have names, but I remember getting 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 all some letters and putting Leiden on the back for some reason with <laughs> centre, which was bizarre because my favourite players was, was Sean Edwards, Andy Gregory and Ellery Anley. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Must have not... been a bit cheaper because it's only LY. <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. Probably that probably did, uh, got a deal somewhere. <laughs> Uh, and I remember getting those tickets from uh, from Wigan School Boys as well. Those complimentary tickets, I can still uh, I can still see Jimmy how they how they felt like going to the game with my dad. Who, who was? Do you know who the player was? Who was actually on? Do you know how they have like the tickets? They just give you complimentary Correct. tickets. And a watermark. There was a watermark. Yeah. Do you know who the player was? I'm going to have a guess. Was it Ian Lucas? No, it wasn't. But it was someone with a skull cap. It was actually Ken G. Was it? It was Ken G. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I never knew that. Never mm-hmm. knew that Wigan uh, Wigan legend, uh, obviously. But uh, yeah, so growing up I had an unbelievable, unbelievable childhood. As I say, my dad took me down to uh, to Henley Giants was what six, six, seven years of age, and and then that that progressed. I played a bit in St Williams, uh, then on to uh, Lee East, believe it or not. Went went, went over to Lee, and then played at uh, Wigan St Patrick's. But a big thing coming from Wigan, as you know, Paul is is representing your town and playing for Wigan Schoolboys, and that was a real big thing. Uh, to get to get selected for Wigan, and I still remember the trials that uh, started at under 11. So it was Mr. Melania and Mr. Hurst that all these mad rugby kids uh, desperate to go and play for Wigan, and the numbers were was was, was massive. So to uh, to get selected for Wigan at uh, Wigan School Boys at that time was a was a really big thing. And fortunately, I did get I did get picked, and I played representing Wigan mm-hmm. School Boys at every age. And do you know what, Paul? I think it was under 12s, under 13s. At that time, we trained at Central Park, we played at Central Park, we used to wear, wear the Wigan kit and mm. was coached by the head coach of Wigan at the time, who were the world champions in Graham West. Yeah. When you think about that now, that's that's pretty incredible, that, isn't it? You think yeah. of what, 12, 13 years of age, mm. of training at, I mean, at, at the time, the best team and in, in club in the world with the uh, the coach that's coaching the world champions. Yeah. It's incredible. It's not surprising that a lot of players then, do you mean, uh, come come out of Wigan, do you know what mm. I mean? Just ju- just with that kind of support, coaching, facilities, I, I suppose. Uh, that was 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 very lucky, and doing that kind of give me springboard in, into the professional game. 
So do you think just staying on the town team, because now it's completely different from when we was growing up, yeah. because it's a scholarship system now. Yeah. And so you as a CEO now at the Warrington Wolves have, you know, a bit of power there now mm. into maybe influence that. Is that something you would bring back? Maybe bring the town teams back and then let them use the Warrington facilities and get the head coach of the Warrington Wolves to be involved in that? Yeah, look, I think I think there's, there's certainly merit in that. I think there's, there's a merit in both systems that, that we've currently got with the scholarship and, and, and the Wigan School Boys. I think a big thing is the quality of coaching. Mm. Uh, it's an area in Warrington that which we're looking to uh, really uh, invest in, looking to really improve. I mean, I think the community coaches out there do an unbelievable job. Uh, do you mean they're all volunteers giving up the valuable time to help develop and progress these kids mm. uh, but an area I think that we need to pr progress progress and, and improve is the quality of the coach and probably that, that goes for all, all terms not, not just Warrington mm. uh, so we're looking to roll out a programme now in conjunction <clears> with a foundation to, to coach the coaches we've, mm. had, we've had Zoom calls we've had, we've had, we've had webinars with, with Peter Ryden and Lee Breeze has done the number as has Andrew Anderson I think Are you I thinking think, of getting think, any decent coaches in? <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you're going to do one next week, aren't you? So, uh, uh, but yeah, so I, I think I think a combination of both is, is 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 the right way to go. I think it's important that we can uh, have that contact time with the kids to help develop them. As I say, but probably more importantly, help develop the coaches. Yeah. But I do think there is a place for uh, the school boy and the town team to come back. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, I completely agree with you. I think the quality of coaches and, like you said, the community game. It's, it's very inspiring, the community game, because everybody gives the time up on a voluntary basis. Yeah. The work that goes in, not just on the game day, but it's behind the scenes as well. Yeah. It's absolutely immense. But because there's a lot of... Um, it's probably one of the things that the coaches um, lack is that there's, there needs to be more education yeah. for them, um, you know, because it's... It, how can I put this? When when you're sort of just a parent and you step into a yeah. coach's role because you need because it needs yeah, filling, yeah. or the team dissipates, then ultimately you just you're just a coach who's there to keep the team together. Yeah, yeah, you're not yeah. actually a coach, so it, it needs to be more education on that side. And the coaches have got to be willing well, to. Learn. We, we have a duty, do you mean, as, as as the professional club of in Warrington to to help nurture those coaches. And you're right. I mean, these parents are. And it tends to be the parents are giving up their valuable time, and they are community heroes. What they do, yeah. I'll be honest, I couldn't do it. It is difficult. Yeah. It is difficult. And like you say, it's not just the training Tuesday night, Thursday night, playing Saturday or Sunday. It's all the preparation that goes into that. It's all the yeah. administration that goes into that. Yeah. And I genuinely mean that they are community heroes to, to mean for what they do for those kids. And I wouldn't be where I'm here today without the support I have of my community coaches yeah. throughout my time, uh, throughout my time playing. So it, they need to be commended at what they do and given that support and around them. It's, that's really important. Yeah, it is. A, like you said, they are community heroes, and that's not you know over selling what they do. They are because you know, like you said, without the community game, we don't have the careers that we have. Correct. You know, we don't sit in the positions that that we're sat in and able to give opportunities. Um, you know, to give give stuff back to other kids. It change people. It can change people's lives for the better. Yeah. And not only in terms of uh, from a professional perspective, and it did it transformed my life. Absolutely, it did. But in terms of it, it educates kids on how to behave in society. Mm. The skills that sport uh, that sport teaches you to in terms of uh, professionalism, overcoming yeah. adversity, communication, uh, teamwork, th things of that nature. I think it's really important. That's why I encouraged my two young two young girls to to get involved in sport. Mm. So that's that's really important. Not only are they uh, developing young kids to be professional uh, rugby league players one day, but it's also educating them how to be better members of society. Yeah, definitely. You know the the skills that you learn. You know, there's there's even businesses out there now that are cert, you know requiring ex professional athletes to come yeah. involved in their companies and businesses because they understand that you know being involved in a professional environment and also a team environment that you can learn qualities. Absolutely. You know, not not everybody does. You know, and everybody learns different things along the way. But I believe that you know being involved in rugby from such a young age and, and playing at a professional level that um, mm. you know it's it's taught me to, um, th that emotional awareness, I feel that the emotional awareness developed a little bit, I've got a better understanding of how people are feeling, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and my communication skills have, have probably got better, you know, I probably won't be doing this podcast mm -hmm. sat in front of a camera yeah. speaking to people without, you know, yeah. learning the, the communication skills in sport. Yeah, we may be jumping headaches, obviously, that was a big part of my player welfare role was, uh, 
explaining to players that the that the characteristics, their experience, their intrinsic values that majority of professional rugby league players have that if they was to divert their energies into a different industry or in a different vocation, they will be successful. Yeah. Do you think about what a professional rugby league player goes through? Uh, first of all, the actual nature of the sport, it is it is brutal. Do you know what I mean? It is it, it is unbelievable. It, it's, uh, it's it's gladiatorial. Yeah. So therefore, they're extreme characters, mm. and if if they channel their energies into a positive way, into a different industry, as I say, I think they will be successful. So you you, you remember Paul when you was playing, you'd have your you'd have your basically your appraisal every Friday night. Mm. You'd you'd be get you getting judged by your peers. You're getting judged by the coaches. You'd be getting mm. judged by the press. Do you know what I mean? And if you wasn't up to standard. You'd get, you'd know about it, and get hit between the eyes, saying that is not good enough. Mm. And I think that kind of repairs you for a life after rugby. Mm. Is you're willing to uh, have that feedback given to you in a brutal manner, reflect, uh, improve, go away, and look to uh, have a better performance the following week. Mm. And those are values that you can apply to business. Yeah. Is 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 that reflection? Is having that uh, performing on the big stage un- under the spotlights and delivering. On uh, on most occasions, which he did, uh, but having that is is preparing you, I think, for a successful career mm. after after the sport. Overcoming adversity, you think of some adversity you've had in your in your professional in your in your in your professional career. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's that's conditioned you to deal with adversity yeah. after you after you after you've played the game, and depending on what vocation or industry you go in. Mm. So I do think that players have those values, those intrinsic values that could be really really successful if applied in a different domain. Yeah, 100%. You know, I, I completely agree though. And I think the key is to, and again, you know, we're jumping ahead a little bit here because and we'll talk about finding our passion after yeah. rugby as well because, um, you know, we the other key element to that is, is, is finding something you're really passionate about. And, you know, I, I say it all the time, rugby league, being a rugby league player is not a job. Yeah. It's it, you're fortunate to do it. You get paid for what you do. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of pressures what come with it, and you've got to be switched on. But at the end of the day, it's not really work, is it? It's, a, it, it's not. It, it, and I say this when you're involved in sports. I suppose any sport, any professional sport, and at, at most levels, whether it's being a player or whether it's uh, an administrator, it's a life. Depending on what role, it's it's a lifestyle. Mm. It is not a nine to five. It is a lifestyle. From a player's perspective, okay, yes, they may be only training, say, from 9am till 2pm, which is great. But if you had a poor performance the week before, you carry that burden with you yeah. for that week. It's it's more than just it's more than just a job. And I think it has to be to get to the the real top level. It has to be more than a job. Yeah. And I say it is a it is a lifestyle. Yeah, it is. You, you know, and I know, like in your role now as a CEO officer, it's very very difficult to switch off, and it's it's the same. Um, and this is one of the uh, struggles that I had with finishing rugby and getting a nine to five job yeah. is that I never switched off. So I was taking my work home, my emails were on my phone, they were on my iPad and I never switched off. And uh, talking about getting an appraisal, you know, I was judged by the press, by the supporters, by my coaches, by my teammates, constantly under scrut- uh, being scrutinized yeah. by people. One thing I really struggled with when I came away from rugby is that not having that feedback from my boss. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, I was sometimes, in a position where, yeah, I'd be speaking to my bosses and maybe, you know, but not getting any feedback. And I really struggled with that because I was used to my coach coming up to me every week and yeah. letting me know where my performance yeah. had gone that week. So I really struggled with, with that element. So there's a lot of adaptation that you've got to get used to uh, when you're out in yeah. the in the real working world. Yeah, yeah. Do you know something else you think? I prepare players to be successful post playing again probably is applicable to a lot of professional sports people is you're on a fixed term contract mm. for what 10 12 13 years of your career mm. now what's the average the average contract length is what two years mm. so you know you have to deliver within those two years or there's a couple of things that could happen yeah. you could lose your job you could get a pay reduction if you, if you don't deliver mm. so you've got that hanging over your head consistently obviously you're the concerns of providing for your family, paying your bills, and you have to sort of, and therefore, you have to deliver. Yeah. Otherwise, when it comes to renegotiating time, it could bring somebody else in, uh, or as you could say, as, as I say, you could get off a reduction in a reduction in salary. So again, you have to perform, not only on a game day, because there's so much that goes in to uh, prior to game day. It's, it's, it's training, it's how you are around the organization. 
Uh, and I think again that that does prepare players to to uh, for for life after career. Cause that is it's pretty ruthless having that. Do you know what I mean that going from a twelve a two year contract or even a twelve month contract? It does prepare you. Yeah, the, and like you said, though, it's not just the playing on the field performances that that are looked at. Everything scrutinised yeah. from your social media, the way that you conduct yourself when you're shopping at Tesco's. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. rude to staff and someone reports that, mm -hmm. then that immediately becomes a black dot above your name. Yeah. And, you know, you, you talk about it, it's an organisation. It's not just about do your shit on the field mm -hmm. for 80 minutes. Everything else has got to be right with it. That's right. That's, that, that's right. And you, you are seen as a role model for, for a number of uh, children and adults, I suppose, within the community. Mm. And with that comes, do you mean that's 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 privilege? That's yeah. privilege, and therefore you need to adhere to certain certain levels of professionalism, certain certain standards. So you can't act probably like a lot of other people can, mm. uh, and you get compensated accordingly. But again, it's it does it does educate you to to how to behave in society again as mentioned earlier about do you mean when you're coming through as a kid and and, and what what rugby gives you so uh holistically it does prepare you to be a better human being and also to be successful in different vocations should you wish to go down that route yeah you're right you know it becomes even though we have a minority sport in this country and with rugby yeah. league you know we're not we're not as big as football but at the end of the day within our communities and the rugby league communities you are looked up to and it's only when you sort of take that step away and you see how the fans are reacting so i took my my son down to wembley in 2018 when we played saints and, and they won and when Dowell clark scored the try all the fans were going absolutely mad and i was stood around watching thinking the way these spectators and fans are chanting for the Warrington Wolves. They was doing the same for us in 2010 and 2012 when we was at Wembley. And my friend said, people were doing that for you and your team back oh, in the day. Yeah. So you, you, when you take a step back and you think, hang on a minute, like a lot of, you've got a lot of responsibility here. Yeah, but that's right. Going back to your playing days now, is the, is the, is the, do you, is the ways that you think, do you know what, I didn't conduct myself the way that I should have done it. <laughs> no, I was a model professional. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, I'll start the ball rolling because I actually do look back on my career and sometimes think I wasn't, Cringe. I wasn't, a, I wasn't the the model professional that I maybe could have been. I let myself down in certain situations. I'm not saying I was bad. Yeah. Um, I felt like you know I could create a decent environment around me at training. But there were certain behaviours that I think. Yeah, do you know I, what? I, I think. Look, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone that can reflect back and say, "Yeah, I was hundred percent professional for the full duration." And I probably, I probably bump in the road that I had, Paul, which, which kind of made me uh, behave more professional or or give me probably a bit of a, 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 a bit of a wake up call that was required. Was uh, so I signed for witnesses. I think I signed for witnesses about fourteen, fifteen. I was. Uh, played for England school boys, I said. Uh, played for England, England, England school boys. Probably thought I was better than I actually was. Went into the witness system. Played a few games for witness uh, at a relatively young age, and probably thought I was better than I actually was. Being honest with you, uh, I wasn't a great player anyway. Uh, but despite being Scotland's nemesis, <laughs> uh, and just got a bit ahead of myself, thought I was better than I actually was. Uh, and probably wasn't as professional as I should have been. Uh, wasn't looking after myself in terms of diet-wise, thing, things of that nature. Uh, and, and witness let me go, and they, they moved me on. I remember, do you know what I mean? Going in and expecting to get an upgrade and an extension, and they, and they said, "You're on your way. You're not, not uh, we don't, we don't think you're good enough. You don't think you're big enough." Which I've had, le I've had levelled at me. Do you mean throughout my career that I've not, I've never been, never been big enough to be a. Uh, a, a Super League player. Is it true though when you was at Witness and they let you go they said you're not big enough sent shop didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said not big enough put the bins out that's what I said. <laughs> uh, and the, and the, it, was just a, it was a massive shock to me a massive shock do you mean as I said coming from Wigan from being six seven years of age all I wanted to do was be a professional rugby player that's all I wanted to do I didn't apply myself uh, academically at, at school although I was quite competent I didn't really apply myself mm. uh, and back then as well witness were a big club because it worked long you know they were still yeah, having, they, they had decent success yeah they had, that time, they had Dougie Lawton was there who we could do a whole podcast on its own speaking about Dougie and, 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 and Dougie's tales he'd come and come my house to sign me uh, and yeah, that which which, uh, which which was a story in fact I'll tell the story I said, so when I went and signed for witness and 
you know, Dougie Long was doing, you know, as I say, he gave me the first opportunity to uh, to enter enter the professional game. So me and my dad went to went to Norton Park into uh, into Dougie's office, and the scout at the time was Kevin Crean that spotted me playing for at least at the time, like under fourteen, I think he was. Mm. He'd spotted me, and said, "What want, want to sign you?" I said, oh, brilliant. Yeah. So went went with my dad. Uh, so goes so he goes into so goes into Dougie's office. Kevin Kareen sat there and Dougie Lawton sat there. So he says, right, okay. So how much do you want? So in that in, at that time they they pay you for giving up your amateur status, and there was some big money getting thrown about at the time, some real big money. So uh, allegedly anyway that that uh, some of the players were receiving from different professional clubs. Anyway, so me and the dad we'd not had absolutely not a clue what uh, what what to ask for. Anyway, quite conveniently, there was a knock at the door. So Dougie said, "Oh, I'll I'll just get that." So Dougie gets up and walks out, walks out the door. So Kevin Crean's there, the scouts. So we said to Kevin, like, "What do we ask for here?" And you're like, ah, six grand, right? Okay." So Dougie Dougie Lawton comes back in. So all right. So what do you want? He says, "Oh, six grand for so six grand. Uh, six grand for giving up my amateur status. So, yes, yeah, so six thousand pound. Yeah, no worries. Puts a contract in front of us. Anyway, so." He signs, he signs the contract, shake hands, I'm actually buzzing, do you know what I mean? It's my first step on the ladder towards, towards a professional career. Anyway, and it was six grand for a three year contract, that's what was agreed. Gets better. Goes <laughs> back. So we signed the contract, it goes back. Anyway, my dad's looking at the contract, and it was actually six grand for five years. Anyway, so at the time, so my dad phones Dougie, Dougie up and says, oh, I think it's been a mistake here. And look, genuinely, it could have been a mistake, but knowing Dougie and knowing how Dougie operates, I think it may have been a little bit more than that. But Dougie <laughs> apologised, oh, sorry, I thought it was for the five years. So <laughs> he knocked uh, on a couple of years off. So, yeah, so Simon for winning this six grand for the for the, uh, for, for the for the three years, yeah. Some good stories about Dougie Lawton. I always remember Moss saying when he gave him his opportunity at Leeds and uh, one of his... Uh, his team talk before they went out and played Sheffield Eagles is he said he walked in with a fag in his mouth <clears throat> and Moz said I was waiting for this inspirational speech he said and he just walked in put his fag in his mouth took a drag blew it out and went you'll beat these men today do you know why because of the fucking shit <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said he threw his cig on floor put it out with his foot and walked out and Moz oh, was like is this, is this what professional rugby oh, league is all about oh he's, he's, he's brilliant <laughs> Brilliant. So when so when I went to witness, we was we started as apprentice went as apprentices, which was uh, goodness, which was uh, that was a that was an experience. And he calls up into he calls up into his office and he chat, asks you about your games. How, how's your kicking going on? Do you know what I mean? Uh, and you've been practicing this. How's your, how's your passing? Do you know what I mean? Really not taking in what what you what he's saying. Anyway, in the meantime, he's rummaging around in petty cash, getting some money out. That's a good lad. Go and get me ten pounds. <laughs> <laughs> True story. That. True story. Yeah, go and get his six for him and come uh, drop him off in his office. There's no. Um... There's no characters really like that in rugby league now, no, is there? No, there's not. But there is, there is, there is char- and I still think there's, there is characters and there is yeah. superstars. I genuinely believe that, but we probably just don't uh, amplify it as as well as we should be. But in terms of characters like that, probably not. Probably rightly so. That's probably that's probably a good thing. We're a lot more professional. But uh, yeah, as I say, we could do a we could do a, a podcast on its on its own, all about uh, all about Dougie Lott, and he was he was a character. Do you think because of like the way social media is now, and the the way that the players have got to conduct themselves outside of um, outside of the club as well? Do you think it sort of waters some of them characters down, and do you think it, or do you? Th- it probably does water them down. I think the answer is it probably does water them down. But um, how do we get more of those characters exposed for what they actually are? Well, you are right. I think with, with the society that we're living now and, and and social media can be ruthless. It can be. I think I think it's a really useful tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, we use it really well here, uh, but it can be. It, it, it can be a dan- it can be a dangerous platform, and, and do you mean some of the stuff that the people put on there is 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 pretty vile. Uh, but yeah, well, I think as a sport, we need we need to amplify those those characters uh, and put the spotlight on those those quirky characters. And I think at times we've shied away from that, mm. uh, and we've we've conditioned our players to be to be robots. And I say robots, not not in the sense of how they play the game, but in terms of how they answer the media, how they interact with the media, how they engage with the media. We've kind of drilled uh, drilled into them to, do you know what I mean? Give the stock standard answers and, and some of the answers that we, that we not the answers, but some of the interviews that we see and just boring, aren't they? They're not yeah. interesting, but it's not really the players' fault as such. It's that they've been 
it's been drilled into them to give them that yeah. stock standard answers from, from 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 different areas within the club maybe or how they've been the media training that they've had and it, and it lacks flavour doesn't it it's just yeah. I don't know it doesn't it, it doesn't stimulate me when there is an interview that's that's been a bit, a bit edgy or they've said something a bit controversial or something a little bit different it's got a bit of colour in it how good is it? It's yeah. brilliant. It's great. It's great TV. It's great content. It's what we want to see. I think the last interview that I saw on Sky TV from one of the players uh, post match was when Ryan Hall spoke about OKR. They'd just been beat, but he'd scored three tries, and he, he gave a little brief description of what he felt Hull should do. And it just wasn't. Uh, it wasn't your stock standard. Yeah. You know, answer well. You know, we didn't complete sets, and they put us under pressure. The same usual nonsense that yeah. we get. You actually give a bit of an explanation as to why he felt you know where he felt Hull could get better as a mm. team and it was just really nice to hear something completely different because you know we've been involved in rugby league for a long time now and you know when you're going into a press conference what questions are going to get asked yeah. you sort of you've already preempted your answers haven't yeah, you? yeah. and it'd be nice if um, you know I think I think we need to get more of a you know a press conference where if it's you know Chris Hill versus Ben Flowers, you yeah. know, Lee versus Wigan. That Chris Hill says, you know, I'm looking forward to smashing Ben yeah, Flowers yeah, up yeah. this week and, yeah. you know, giving a little bit of controversy and a little bit of an edge to a game and, and building it up for what it is because, you know, that's that's what the spectators love to see instead of just saying, yeah, well, you know, they're a good team and, they, you know, they you know they come from the Heartlands and, yeah, you know, yeah. it's great to have them back in Super League, etc., etc. Do you know what I reckon, Paul? I, re I reckon one of the... Re and and I think this is a great trait of the sport, but I think that's a cultural issue as well. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a trait of northern working class people that mm. they're quite humble. They don't want to, do you know what I mean? They don't want to yeah. put the, the head, neck on the line, and I, I think that's some, that's something to do with it. Because some of our marketing has been frowned upon, uh, yeah. eyebrows raised with some of the stuff that we've done, and we're not doing it to disrespect the opposition. I, I, absolutely not. Do you mean I've got yeah. the utmost respect for every single player, every single coach, every single club within within the the, the, the in, in rugby league? Do you know what I mean? I have, and I, and I, and I genuinely mean that. Uh, what we're trying to do, we're trying to create exposure yeah. by by that approach, and it, and it is different. It has got people talking about it, and you mentioned like the Ben Flower and, and Chris Hill going up against one another, and we. One of the games, uh, we played Wigan a couple of years years ago, and in each game that we play, we have a theme or uh, or a narrative behind it. And the Wigan game was the rivalry between Warrington and Wigan, as, as you full well know. It's always been uh, feisty affairs. It's been brutal, and we named that game. I would label that game bad blood, but the narrative, the story, was all about the rivalry between organisations. That game, we sold out three home stands because of that. And at the time, we wasn't playing that great, uh, to be fair. So. It's it's marketing the sport in a different way to gain that mass or, or further exposure. Mm. It's because people go on social people go on social media and it's and they're looking for that dopamine hit. And if it's just your stock standard post information, yeah. what they're going to do? Scroll straight past it. Go yeah. straight past it. You've got what three seconds to grab their attention. Yeah. And that's really important that that we put content out that's going to grab your attention. Tell us about the. Well, touch on the the interview that got pulled down from the rugby league. Then, where Paul Cullen was doing his uh, talk and explain why it got pulled yeah, down. Yeah, and I, and I understand that. So, uh, Paul obviously thought what of the club did a, a fantastic interview about the uh, about the brutality of Wigan and Wigan Wigan Warrington games. You all know the famous World War Three game, yeah. New Year's that New Year's Day was it at uh, at Wilderspool? And again, do you know what I mean? It's it's, it's fantastic viewing. It's thuggering. I'm not saying we go back to them days. Absolutely not. Do you mean for, for, far from it but it's that kind of voyeurism people want to see that don't they, they get excited by that they get ent yeah. entertained by that and we use that as a as a hook to uh, also I should say we uh, put the spotlight on that to kind of show the uh, the animosity between the two clubs the dislike uh, although there's a massive healthy respect between the two organisations you mean yeah. a lot of respect for Chris Chris Vandlinski and Ian Lennigan mm. uh, in, in particular you could say he's a poor man's Carl Fitzpatrick <laughs> you? Uh, both playing full he wasn't a bad player Rans, actually yeah, yeah, he was all right, he wasn't a bad player so mm. we we uh, and, and, and so we use we use we, we, we use Paul uh, and that clip and Paul speaking speaking about that clip, uh, but Paul but then he was asked to pull it down because obviously Paul's links with with the RFL and, and, and the disciplinary in particular. So out of respect, we did we did pull that down. I understand it from from their perspective, but do you mean 
the definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. If we keep continue to market in the same way, uh, the sport, well, we're probably not going to break out of this this bubble that we seem to be we seem to be uh, encased in. Yeah, we'll touch more on this, but we're just going to go to a short break and let hear from our sponsors. At Get a Tax Rebate, we make it easy for you or your business to claim back thousands of pounds in tax. Most people, like Jane and Philip, don't realise that they are owed money from HMRC, so they never claim. All you need to do is fill out a simple form on our website and we'll do the rest. It's that simple. We've also helped business owners claim back millions of pounds in research and development R&D tax credits. So if you're working in a business or own one, contact us today to see if we can help you claim back tax and improve your cash flow. Get a tax rebate, your tax refund concierge. Eighteen ninety five sports on state of mind, the ultimate lineup. Macy Vienna Aesthetics based in Wigan. For all your wrinkle treatments, dermal fillers, lip enhancement, energy boost injections, immune boost injections. Please visit us on Facebook or Instagram at Macy Vienna Aesthetics. CDX Security, proudly supporting Rugby League. Okay, welcome back to part two where we'll chat more with Carl Fitzpatrick. Been so insightful so far because you can see that you've got a massive passion for for the game, really, yeah. that's give you you know, it's, it's give you a lot of opportunities, yeah. hasn't it? And it's, it's, it's given me everything, it's given me family everything. Do you know what I mean? My, 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 my wife was a, was a physio at Bradford. Uh, in the mid 2000s, and again, it springboarded her career uh, into education, running running courses at Bolton University, and now yeah. moving moving over to UCLan. So it just it just gave me so much, and I owe the sport nothing. Uh, sorry, I owe the sport. That's definitely going on the edits. <laughs> I, I owe the sport everything. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't owe me nothing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, it's like you say, it's a very similar backgrounds and, and we're so fortunate that even though, you know, I'm, I'm we're both no longer players, it still offers us opportunities to, to get involved yeah, with it, different it, projects. It does, and it was touching on earlier, though, do you mean, uh, about being as professional as you should be and, and, and what you a professional for, do you mean, your full duration of your career, and we obviously lost, we got chatting about, about Dougie Lawton, and my career nearly stopped before we got, we got started, so as I was saying, at, at, the, at the time, at Witness, as I thought I was going for an extension, an upgrade, and they're saying, you're on your way, mm -hmm. so I went from being a, a full-time professional player, to working with my dad and, and, and brother in construction, mm -hmm. so one day, do you know what I mean, I'm in, I'm in the gym, my mates, lifting weights, going out in the field, throwing the ball around, finished mm -hmm. at two o'clock, to laying flags down at the side of a motorway, mm. and that but that was the best education that I could have had at that time. I wasn't yeah. just professional; I should be with my diet and things, things of that nature. I was just playing with it, mm. uh, and it was just a massive shock to my system. Yeah. Uh, so I worked in construction for a little bit, and then worked at a biscuit factory with my mum. Mm. Uh, then I also worked for a company called Eccles Savings and Loans, doing home loans. Yeah. Uh, my area was my area was uh, was Saint Helens. It's similar to the Prudential going back in going back in the day, like yeah. your grandma and granddad's used to uh, do savings and have loans, and the, and the guy would come and collect the mm. uh, collect the payments on a weekly basis. And I was doing that at 20 years of age. Yeah. My area was Saint Helens, giving out home loans in and around in and around Saint Helens, on going collecting it on a weekly basis, and talk about uh, having to having having people skills and, yeah. and things of that nature. That was a, a real a real learning curve and quite enjoyable actually meeting different people and so we had loans we did like vouchers and uh the t t tv it entered the tv it's uh, what's it called the uh what's it when you put the uh the the, the money in it in, money in the tv money in the yeah. meter yeah. i go and em em empty that and that, so that was a that was an experience and as i say so as a professional we pay then buying i mean in the real in the real world i thought mm. oh my goodness 
this is this is real life this is real tough and probably had a bit more not a bit more respect for mum and dad have an unbelievable amount of, of respect for mum for and dad growing up but give me an insight on, on what they do do you know what I mean your dad worked in the building game till he was 70 years of age my mum worked in a biscuit factory similar thought do you yeah. know what I mean that is hard graft mm. if I get another opportunity to prefer, being a professional player I'm going to take it with both fans so then I signed for Swinton so I was playing part time uh, and unfortunately I got an opportunity to uh, to go to Salford to play in the under 21s as it was at the time mm. so I, I left Swinton played I think <clears> seven or eight games to Swinton went to join Salford again it's working full time but playing part time for their under 21s mm. uh, and then in fact, Steve McCormack signed me. Uh, he signed me and got sacked, got sacked the next day, so I finished him off. Uh, so, played in the under-21s and went, went okay, to yeah. be fair. Carl Harrison took over and I'll never forget the call. The phone to me up says, we want to bring you in full-time. I'm like, yes, do you know what I mean? At, at last, I'm going to take this opportunity with both fans. I've been dying for this opportunity again. I'm not going to let it go. Mm. He said, can you come and meet Steve, Steve Sims uh, after the weekend or, or, or the following week or whatever it may be? Steve Sims at the time was the director of rugby. So I'm buzzing, goes to see Steve. He says, yeah, and uh, it's not great news, this. I said, oh, what, what, what's a sporty car? They want to give me full time, wants to give me full time contract. Yes, it does, but unfortunately, there was no money left. Mm. I was like, oh my goodness. I said, I need to build myself up. I'll be really excited for this opportunity. I've been grafting. Uh, anyway, as I say, it was a big shock to the system. Uh, so I said, right, okay. So I went away and I was just absolutely, do you know what I mean, distraught. So I phoned Carl up. I says, look, uh, I know you want to bring me full time, but obviously there's, 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 there's no money there. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I'll come and work. I'll come and train. I'll do the pre-season. Don't pay me. Mm. At the time, I was still living at home with mum and dad. So, uh, do you know what I mean? It was no issues in that, in that in terms of paying a mortgage, although it was tough. I said, I'll come and do the pre-season. And if I'm worth a contract at the end of it, if you can find some money from somewhere, well, great. So I started that pre-season again. I was the first one in. I was the last one to leave. I went on my day off and basically made it virtually impossible for him not to give me a contract yeah. at the end of that pre-season. Uh, and I fortunately did. Now, albeit it was only seven grand, yeah. uh, but it gave me the foot that again, that step on the ladder to being professional Super League players is, yeah. is, is, is what I wanted to be. And I've probably taught those lessons into my career uh, moving forward. That do you mean if you're willing to uh, put yourself out there yeah. and, and probably, and I have a bit of management, do, do whatever it takes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I was probably, I was prepared and, and still am in, 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 in some areas to. To do what others aren't. Obviously, everything's got to be ethical, but I was prepared to go and do that, which probably yeah. most of a lot of the players wasn't. Yeah. But by doing that, Carl thought, you know what? Well, fair play, and he mustered up seven grand for me, mm. and, 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 it, and it went from there. And that is, there's a great lesson in that because um, it's not the only time that you've done it throughout your career and all that. And, um, you know, it's a great example of if you want something hard enough. Yeah. Um, you know that there is always a where well, there's a will there's a way yeah. and sometimes you do have to make a big sacrifice but, yeah and yeah. sometimes that that does have to be financially as yeah. well it it, it 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 does and like i was doing extras and, and some of the senior players kind of laughing at me and frowning you know what i mean saying all yeah. oh, this he's not even getting paid and he's, and he's doing this but i was i didn't think her yeah not bothered whatsoever do you mean i wanted to be a professional <laughs> player and i was willing to do what most of the people wasn't yeah uh, unfortunately things things did pan out in that respect i understand some people may not be in a position to do that mm -hmm. uh it's got to be calculated and and uh but i i was yeah i was and i, and I was willing to do that and uh as I say, fortunate to get a contract at the end of it, although it's probably less than minimum wage, but I didn't care at that time. It was a foot on the ladder and you all progress. Yeah, and I know, like, you, you, again, it's this is I think this is a cultural thing and this is a, a typical rugby league players thing. What you say, you know, you was you was just below average or you was average, but you had a good playing mm -hmm. career. You know, you were Salford's top player. You know, there was time, talks of you signing for Wigan. You played for Ireland, represented mm -hmm. your country. You know, you was better than average. Um, I know we joked around at the beginning, but, you know, you was a good player. You returned the ball back. You could see that you was very... Um, you know, you, you returned the ball with, with plenty of aggression and, yeah. and, and there was a will to win there, do you yeah. know what I mean? And at the time, you know, playing at Salford, um, when you do a team video and you're looking at your opposition, you know, it's... 
you know, watch this guy. He's a pinball. Is this true? I, I, someone told me that. I, I told, uh, mentioned this to me that uh, we he was doing a preview and I'd scored a try and I did and I did and I did a silly I did a daft dance. It was someone said I looked like this guy off Big Big Brother at the time and I did a daft dance and supposedly Paul Cullen said. If he does that in this game, <laughs> if no one hits him, you're in for it. <laughs> I think I think it was was it grab the ankle and the, uh, with, with the knee wobbling. I think it was that, but yeah, that that that's true. That, but you, but again, like going back to what we're trying to talk about now and create with the players, and I've been like fortunate enough to speak to Martin Afire, and Martin Afire said it really well that he understood that he needed to brand himself as a player, yeah, even yeah. back in the nineties, and. Because Wigan was a successful team, it probably made it a little bit easier for him. But he made he worked hard for it, and he was on like programs like Emmerdale yeah, Firm, and yeah. where it's catapulted him now, it, it's still he's still um, you know he's still he's reaping those profile, rewards. He, yeah. It is, yeah, and you know we need characters to be able to do like stupid dances and silly dances yeah, on the field that's because. It. That's what gets you noticed. We yeah. need personalities out there. And there's a cultural thing around that where you score a try and you just put the ball down and you walk back with your head down. And I always remember Tony Smith when he came here. One of the things that he he, he basically forced you to do yeah. is celebrate a I try. You're, you, you, you're right. And, and again, it's it, it, I think that is a cultural issue that if you are a little bit lurry or do a little bit different, that it, it's yeah. frowned upon or... Or question for well, the look, peers or look, coach, but it, but it, but it, but, it, but it shouldn't be. Well, look at what you said, uh, Carl, when you was training at Salford. Why yeah. should you get frowned upon for doing extras? Do you know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. Um, there's a cultural thing there with um, he's just sucking ass. Yeah. He's just trying to get. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's like yeah. no one ever thinks that you're just trying to better yourself. Mm. You know. Um, just moving forward because. You know, like I say, you know, you had you had a good playing career. You've got a passion for rugby because you're still involved in it, so that's obviously shows. But I spoke about the commitments that well, we spoke about the commitments that you've made as a player. You know, giving up uh, your time to try and gain a contract. But I remember you coming to Warrington wanting to be part of the strength and conditioning team because you've done your sports masters yeah. degree um, and doing exactly the same thing to yeah, you know yeah. to show that you're worth your, your weight in gold really yeah so <clears throat> probably from the lessons that I'd, I'd learned from be, be, being a player and getting my foot on the ladder in, in my in my playing career so at the back end of me of my playing career at Salford I'd go and do a uh, I did a sports forms degree over, over in Leeds so I'd, I'd train then twice a week and go over to Leeds to study because I, I did at that time I wanted to go and work in the performance department strength and conditioning sports sports science that yeah. th th those kind of roles uh, and I thought again if I could offer my services free of charge surely they're not going to not, not going to reject that and uh, Luke Warrington a bit fantastic club had some great on-field success uh, allowed me to come work with with, with Tony Smith and I'm, and I'm so thankful for the opportunities that Tony Tony gave me uh, so I, I approached approached Warrington I spoke to Tony I spoke to Chris Barron who's uh, obviously he's, he's, he's still at the club and said look I want to get into uh, strength and conditioning is there any opportunities don't want again don't want to be paid just want to want to learn to gain that experience mm. So they thought, yeah, okay, well, he's not going to cost us anything. Yeah. Uh, come on, board. Stock standard for rugby league. Yeah, yeah, which is <laughs> anything, anything, <laughs> anything for, for free. Won't yeah, I, su it. I suppose so. I suppose so. But that was tough. That was tough. Earning a uh, an average Super League salary for an average player. Yeah. <laughs> not earning a decent. No, seriously, earning a decent Super League salary uh, to earning nothing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? With a wife and two kids at the time was mm. was difficult. Was was difficult that two thousand so it was end of two thousand and ten so that Christmas two thousand and ten was was pretty bleak but again I had an unbelievable wife who supported me throughout and said look if this is what you want to do we just gonna have to uh, just have to cut back and just mm -hmm. and just make it work uh, make it work now again and I, I knew that if I was given the opportunity I'd show my work ethic I'm showing what I'm about that I'd be able to progress mm -hmm. so uh, I joined Warrington as a volunteer. Didn't get paid for for four months, and I still mentioned to, to finance that you still owe me four months' wages. <laughs> uh, and within that time, I, look, I enjoyed uh, working with with in and being in and around the performance the performance department, but probably wasn't wasn't uh, that that keen or 
had that massive appetite to continue as being a strength and condition. I thought, yeah. do I want to do this for the next 20, 30, 30 years? Mm -hmm. Not sure. Not sure. Burning Man, I've done a, I've just done a three year degree in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, not sure. Although <clears> I must like I said, enjoyed being around the performance department. And then an opportunity presented itself. So, a good friend of ours, Brian Carn, who was a play welfare manager at the time, his commitments with Sky was increasing. So, we had to step away from the role. So, Tony brought me in and said, Look, I know you're not coming for this. But do you fancy doing this role? This is what it involves. It's, it's uh, helping prepare the players for life after rugby, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, do you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, do you know what? I don't mind. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try that. And again, it was it was it was a paid role, uh, and then and then that progressed. So I was play welfare manager, uh, and then once I started working in the administ administration uh, role with, with, within the club, I, I soon. Uh, decided I want to be a chief executive one day so again what do I need to get to that level to be a CEO mm. uh, and whilst I was a player I had always had a very I mean, a keen interest in business I was quite entrepreneurial I had a supplement company I had import goods from, from, from China electrical goods so uh, I had a really keen interest in business and, and, and as I say I was quite entrepreneur, entrepreneurial when I was a I was a player at Salford I suppose you had to be able to only seven grand a year to, to find other <laughs> ways of income uh, so, like I say, I always, I always had a keen interest in business. So, what do I need? To, what do I need to do? So, uh, and then did an MBA again back to university to study. I thought, right, okay, that's going to give me uh, an education around business. But I also understood that I need some practical experience. So, I would go out uh, regular visit different different industries, different companies, different organisations. Uh, I'd spend uh, lots of time in the administration area with it with it within Warrington. Uh, and then, fortunately enough, I, I, I managed to progress and, and the board gave me the opportunity to be the chief executive from uh, from 2017. I suppose as a, as a rugby player, it sometimes seems as a natural progression, I think, going into the SNC. And we do see people who, who you know, go from player to yeah. strength and conditioning roles and, you know, they really enjoy it. Eddie Gardner being one of them yeah. is at Warrington now, but I, I, I did exactly the same thing. You know, I sort of got involved went to university yeah. like yourself, you know, completed my degree and sort of got into it and thought, this is not for me, this yeah. is not for me. And um, very similar to yourself, really, you know, I think uh, what looking to get into welfare, the welfare side of things now, but I think that, that, suits, that suits you, I think, mm -hmm. because you've got um, a knack of wanting to help people and yeah. improve people as, as people as well. Yeah, yeah, but, but I, w I would say that I think it's better. I'm glad I did. The, I'm glad I did the sports performance degree. I, I, I am. Do you know what I mean? Despite me not working in that area, it, yeah. it did give me some. Uh, it did give me good insight within 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 performance and, and and improving performance in terms of physical performance. But it also it taught me sort of presentation skills, yeah. uh, reading reports, uh, mm -hmm. referencing th things of that nature. Uh, so I thought there was a lot of skills that I gained from doing that degree that wasn't necessarily related to that subject matter or, or to that topic. So yeah. I think if someone's not sure on doing something, I think it's better to do something yeah. than to do nothing. No, 100%. You know what? I was very anti-education when I was at school. Yeah. I didn't yeah. like it. And I knew a lot of people who were got where they was because of who they knew. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like your network is your net worth. I do believe that. But there's an element where education is so important yeah. you know and, and like you said you know going to university and not using my master's degree now so what I've, I, I know how to you know research i know how to read studies i know yeah. how to look at statistics i know how to reference things and you know i don't one of the big things that it taught me is that my opinion means nothing without facts yeah. so i know i can go out and actually look at yeah. the information and think do you know what what my perception is and what my opinion is this is actually wrong because the statistics are telling me this and i can find good research studies and i can find you know yeah, the ones yeah. what are not that good so you know going back to my own education now because i'm doing this counseling and i want to be a qualified counselor it's so easy for me now to do this online because of my education yeah. from university without that I, I would really really struggle because there is a lot of referencing that's needed within this yeah yeah very similar part like i say I, I was quite competent at school. I really didn't really didn't apply myself because I was just pure, purely fixated on being a yeah. being a professional belief player, which which wasn't probably the smartest of, of things to do. But as I say, yeah, there's so many skills that I picked up at uh, university that wasn't, I mean, really related to to, to to the degree itself. Yeah. 
Let's talk about, before we finish, let's talk about marketing rugby league now. And I know that you, um, we have regular conversations regarding this. And, you know, we've, I think we have similar beliefs in terms of that, you know, rugby league is very old school in terms of its approach around yeah. the game. And, you know, regarding, you know, bringing away fans to basically budget yeah, yeah. On, on the fact that, you know, certain teams will bring so many away fans and, yeah. and you've got to... A belief that you know we need to get away from that and yeah. market our own fans bring more of our own spectators into the ground than relying on other clubs to do do that for us yeah look and, it, and it's, it's it's being really strategic like <clears throat> people sometimes think that i mean we just rely heavily on our so on our controversial social media posts and there's so much to it than that so mm. much to it than that do you know what i mean it's it's analyzing penetration areas within warrington where, where do we have a uh, high number of season ticket holders in Warrington uh, in comparison to, to, to the population of, of that postcode and it's being really specific and really target on that so it's a real holistic approach in terms of uh, in terms of mar- <coughs> excuse me <coughs> in terms of in terms of marketing the club yes the, the controversial social media posts do 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 get headlines it's what people like to talk about but there's so much go- goes into it than just a just a controversial tweet. Yeah. Uh, although I do think that's that that is quite quite important. Is 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 the content? I mean, it's engaging content that people. Uh, pe- pe- it, it, it's engaging. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, I think you got something like three seconds to grab someone's attention. Otherwise, it's going to scroll straight on past you and look at some another sport or another product or yeah. or something else. So you've got to stand out. You've got you got to be you got to be different and that's what we're trying to do here so was the greg inglis post regarding the shirt was that a setup honestly honestly was that I a leak or was that, that a... what do you think well i know that i don't I, honestly i don't know but I, when, the I, fact when that I, we're sat here now and how long you been on speaking about months, it. speaking about it yeah says, and the, says it so, says it says it all doesn't it it does and and, and it won't put, put it past me but i don't know whether it was a blunder which was made into Something like this is a marketing <laughs> trick, or whether well, Greg, you've never uh, given me uh, an honest Greg, answer. Gr- Greg's uh, like Greg's very experienced, is it? And he's done plenty of t- photo shoots in the past. Do you think he'd be yeah. uh, naive enough or novice enough to put something out there? That, yeah. uh, I understand that. Yeah, you're still you not giving me a straight you answer, though. Are you? <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you decide on that. Uh, but regardless of whether it was or not. If it was, you know, if it was a mistake, it got pulled round ultra quick, and it yeah. was made into something that, at the end of the day, you got the national exposure. Yeah, exposure, and, that, and that's and that's key not only for the Warrington Wolves brand, but also for our partner brand. So for last year, last year, Neil, Nielsen, an independent body that evaluates uh, sponsorship. Uh, it's, I mean, I think they, they work right across Super League, the Premier League, the league. I mean, they, they are world renowned. And uh, as I say, and they, and they can value sponsorship in terms of exposure. How many eyeballs have have, have, uh, have come across their brand? Yeah. And last year, our principal partner Hoover had more exposure than any other sponsor within Super League. Mm. Now consider that, considering we did get to the Challenge Cup final, which has, you mean, fantastic viewers. Yeah. Uh, considering we didn't get to the Grand Final again, which has tre- tre- tremendous viewers that due to our marketing activations and our approach that the brand was exposed to a, a, a audience bigger mm. than any other uh than any other sponsor within super league yeah it's, it's it's a good it's a good statistic isn't it you know like say so you didn't get to a major final but yet you still got that exposure yeah. for for your sponsors i, I suppose it, it shows that you know that that you're working and also it gives you the opportunity then to resell that sponsorship deal yeah. and renegotiate it does, that it, deal it, it does it does it's, and it's about being really really proactive with the media mm. we often do you mean how, how many times do we hear people say oh we don't get the go and let the column inches we don't get the media that we deserve mm. okay yeah agree with that what are you doing about it yeah what are you doing if it's that such a, a strategic priority what are you doing about that to go bang the <clears> bang <throat> the doors down it's like uh i made i put a call into gq I wanted our plays in the gq magazine now eventually we got to, uh, by a different channel, we got Josh Charlie in there. Yeah, there was a picture the other day of uh, of Owen Farrell on the front of Men's Health. Yeah, I took a picture of it, sent it to Super League. Said that's what we need to be aiming for. Yeah, that's our ambition. That's what we want. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because you think, do you mean some of our players do look unbelievable? Do you mean athletically do look unbelievable? And some of them are really good looking as well. Yeah, I look at Tommy Makinson that was on Soccer AM recently, which is 
fantastic. You yeah. know, I saw that. I was really, I was buzzing with that because that's yeah. what we need. Mm. That's what we need to do. We need to break out of this uh, rugby league media bubble mm. and into the national media, which is difficult, easy said than done. It, it is it is difficult, but that's what we need to be striving for. We need to be really proactive with all media. And like you say, you know, it's what what are clubs doing to in, to increase that exposure and. and and you do have to create controversy, don't you? You've got to create controversy in some capacity because that is what gets you news. There's a fantastic documentary on uh, you on, on it was on the UFC called uh, Bad Blood Good Business, mm. and it speaks about what what do they need to sell a fight? And he said, you need conflict, mm. and you need a story. Yeah. But probably more importantly have the ability to set to tell that story. Mm. And you think in rugby league, and again, going back to ourselves versus Wigan, do you know what I mean? There's conflict there between the two clubs, uh, like there would be between Hull, Hull, Hull KR, uh, Wigan Saints, uh, Warrington Witness, there's, and then and that's at a, at a macro level. You can then even go down to, uh, a, at a play level, example used before, Chris Hill and Ben Flower, yeah. we, could, we could do that. There's a conflict. There could be a story there. There could be some history there. Mm. We need to tell that story. Yeah. It gets people. It gets people uh, engaged. It gets people's interest. But too often, more often than not, we shy away from telling that story mm. and putting the spotlight on that conflict. Yeah. And we shouldn't. Mm. And we and, and we shouldn't. Do you mean there's all respect between the clubs, between the players? Unbelievable respect. In the long and, and, I, and I understand coaches can get a little bit nervous about that. Uh, in terms of putting the spotlight on that and could be seen to be perceived to be disrespect, disrespectful to to the opposition, but we've got to see the greater good here. We're trying to get a bigger audience, uh, more money will come into the game, and I think that's really important that the coaches understand that that we're not doing it to disrespect the players or the team. We're doing it to sell it because this is the greatest sport in, in the world, and I generally mean that we have some of the best athletes on this planet. Mm. Fact. Yeah. They've got to be fast. They've got to be strong. They've got to be fit. They've got to be fit, and they've got to be mentally resilient to play our sport. It's yeah. brutal. Yeah. You think about what a player does. Yeah. <clears throat> We've got some the best athletes in the world, and we deserve to put them on a bigger platform to mm. a wider audience. Yeah, hundred percent, mate. And do you know what? There's an expression that's in my head now, and it's and and it's it's not personal. It's just business, mm -hmm. and it's a great expression because. This is this is what I think all clubs need to work together yeah. and 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 not take it personal. Mm. You know, Warrington Wolves flying a plane over St. Helens' ground is not personal. It's just business and it's creating exposure. Mm. And that's what clubs need to get around and they need to start working together to create a little bit of controversy that's staged in a way, but but real as well, do you know yeah, what I mean? And that's the key as well. That's the key. Is it's it's got to be authentic. Yeah. If it's if it's too stage, it just it just doesn't wash. And, and yeah. doing support. We're not talking WWE. No, like. no. You, you, all laws. I think there's some lessons that we could take from that in terms of storytelling. Uh, but that's just a way over the top, way over the top. But the thing is, Paul, we don't we don't need to stage it. I know. The there. Yeah. I know. It's, it, it, do you I know. mean it, it's it, the there? The conflicts there. When I say conflict, I'm not on about anything underhand or anything like that. I'm just on about healthy. Uh, healthy probably uh, that's not respect it's probably disrespect that they have one of although there's an unbelievable amount of respect between the two clubs do you know what I mean there's a there's a bit of animosity between uh, certain players and we don't yeah. put the spotlight on it enough and do you know what we, <clears throat> we, we talk about the time when um, obviously it was worldwide news when I ruptured my testicle in the grand final yeah. it was absolutely massive I was doing interviews everywhere in yeah. different countries um, talk sport radio, I was on the BBC News. It was getting so much limelight and exposure, and then it, it just there was nothing from the yeah. rugby league. You know? <clears throat> that's that, what I was saying that... earlier. It's got to be strategic. Do you know what I mean, it's no point putting out something that's sensational. It's then how do we how do we capitalise on that, and how yeah. do we then uh, engage with that uh, that viewer or, or, or that you know, that person that's that's, mm -hmm. that's come across that article again to entice them. Into yeah. our sport because when people watch our sport, they fall in love with it. Do you yeah, know? Do, we yeah. we often bring partners to to the game that uh, do you mean not never been to a rugby league, rugby league game uh, before, and they come where they're like, wow, this is just yeah. unbelievable. This is just like one of the best kept secrets yeah. of all time. Yeah. Do you know what I mean we just need to expose our sport to a to a bigger audience? Mm. So what what plans have Warrington got in place now to, in terms of? creating that bigger exposure and um, in fact I'll ask you another question before you do answer that but in terms of the expansion um, 
what would you like to see from rugby league now? Would you like to see us expand out of the Artlands and bring in other cities? So maybe I'm just picking a city out of argument, say to you, but say to you, but the likes of York, maybe Birmingham and yeah. Cardiff. Or... Look, I, I think they're not mutually exclusive. I think there's, there's still a big job to do in our Heartlands to get it to sport really thriving in, in its Heartlands. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, but whilst we're doing that, we can also have a look at maybe going to York, but being, being really strategic with it again. So uh, Magic this year is at Newcastle. Do you know what I mean, can we get a three-year plan uh, together, say, we, the RFL and, and, and Super League, where, OK, maybe Newcastle, so we've got Magic there for the next three years. I mean, World yeah. Cups, World Cup games, uh, it's, it's just game, game played there. And really growing the sport in the North East, putting some invest in it, putting some resource in it for them to enter Super League in five years time whatever it may be whilst continue to grow it grow it in the heartland so i don't think it has to be mutually exclusive yeah i agree um the only you know again this is something we've spoke about but when you look at some of the populations within the rugby league communities yeah. they're not big populations no. so basically what you're asking is it's, pre it's pretty much an unrealistic task for some of the 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 heartlands of, of rugby league to generate these big um, you know, spectating crowds. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you look at so Lee, for example, have got a, a population of what is it, sixty thousand people. Mm. Um, I'm sure, but yeah, it won't be much. Yeah. You know, you're you're asking them to get like twenty five percent of their population to all congregate in Lee Centurion Stadium to create this twenty thousand uh, capacity. Yeah. Um, stand and that, but that is where we do need to be get yeah. aiming at. You know, we need to be filling stadiums, not just having. You know, there's nothing worse than watching Wigan versus Huddersfield at the DW and you've got one stand completely empty and just like 10,000 dotted fans around the stadium. I but can you say it. we've done all we can, ourselves included, all we can, we've done to get those supporters through that gate? For that. Have, we, have, we, have, we, have we saturated that market from a marketing perspective, from a media perspective, from an engagement perspective with, with that community to get everyone through that gate in a smart, strategic and creative way? Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. So I still think there is there is some growth areas. Now, yes, you're right. Due to the population, there may be limitation on that. Mm. But have we done everything we can? Yeah. Not and, sure. And that's why I was a big advocate of maybe putting York into Super League. Yeah. You know, there's a population of around two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. yeah. people. There's a bigger population there. You know, there's a bigger catchment market. Um, York are doing some great things. Um, so you know, taking it to big cities. I know. <sighs> You've got you've you've sort of got a group of people who just want to see like the Heartlands come through, but yeah. is the bigger picture taking it to some of these bigger cities? I think so. Yeah, I think it can bring value. As I say, I believe it's not mutually exclusive. It's, it's let's do all we can within the Heartlands, within uh, your traditional clubs, within your tradition, within, within, within your towns. Do all we can within that. Whilst also having a look at other opportunities further afield, and I agree with you. I think York could bring could, could bring some value. Do some clubs maybe need to have a look at merging as well? You know, bring, coming together. Would, that's, that a controversial, have... that's a controversial. That's a controversial topic. That wasn't it, was it? Warrington and Witness Cheshire, and yeah, I'm not look. I'm not sure on that one. Mm. Not not sure. Like we speak we speak about uh, Cumbria, don't we? Yeah. I mean about the potential and value that Cumbria could potentially bring. But yeah. we need to do the research. We need to be strategic. We need to do an an analysis of that area. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And the potential that area has and what value can it can it bring to Super League? Mm. And we've got the Rugby League World Cup at the end of the year, which hopefully will bring us some good exposure. But we've we've said it before with the World Cup, and we've said it during some of the Ashes series when England won against New Zealand, was it 2018 when they won the the uh, the series against New Zealand? Yeah. The try, <clears throat> you know. So we've we've and we keep saying this is it. This is this is the the next step now, and you know, rugby league's going to get you know some something that it deserves, and it's going to get more money. But at the end of the day, we, we we are going backwards. We're not going forwards. We're just not because financially, we're not in a good. I know we've had the pandemic and the coronavirus, but prior to that, rugby league was never in a great spot. It's it's mm -hmm. actually gone backwards. We we talk about the Wigan days when we were kids, where players were getting paid more then than some of the players who are actually playing now so how, how does that work in terms of it is it's and clubs have got to take, clubs have got to take responsibility for that so you mentioned about the world cup and do you know what I mean we're fortunate we're going to have three games here at the, at the hj so and a number of those supporters that will come to those games may not be rugby league supporters yeah so it's us being strategic 
uh, gain access to that data and converting those supporters into warranted supporters, into Wigan supporters, into Hull supporters, whatever it may be. Mm. It's been real strategic. I think at, at times it's been too ad hoc. Uh, and it's, it's about working together, working with the RFL, working with, with the Rugby League World Cup. Mm. And this is, and, and they're doing a big legacy, they're doing a big, as they're saying, they're doing some uh, legacy funding. Mm. And I think that's the word that keeps getting banded about is, is legacy. And, Again, and you're right, Paul. There's been so many opportunities that you know, we, we've shot ourselves in the foot. We've not capitalised on these opportunities, but now there's again there's another opportunity presented itself to create a real legacy. Mm. Games are going to be on free to air, so there's a real opportunity now to grow the sport. And I think it is, it's a it's an exciting opportunity. Mm. It's something that's going to be massive for the game. Yeah, it is exciting. It is an opportunity. I think when you've been involved in the game for so long and you've heard the same repetitive stuff over, it, it, you sort of you take it with a pinch of salt. I don't know. You know, I'm a big believer in. I want players to get paid more money to yeah. play rugby league. I want the people who are involved in the backroom staff and everybody else they should get paid more money because as we've touched on as we've been speaking it's not a nine to five job it's a lifestyle you make a lot of sacrifices it's not just you who make the sacrifices so do your families yeah you know so there's got to be some financial a bit more of a financial reward for for the people who are involved in the game but we need more money to come into the game of course to, we to do, do that absolutely absolutely do you mean, <clears throat> i mean the play the, the players get you mean a significant uh portion of, of revenue that comes into uh comes into super league clubs so we can't do that and I agree with you, do you know I mean? I'd love to hear players more money, do you know what I mean? I'd love that was, if there was on uh, football salaries, I'd absolutely love that. But, but then they've it, got to buy into the marketing side of it the economics of it well. simply just, does, just doesn't work. Yeah. It, 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 just, it just doesn't work. And as I mentioned earlier about uh, Owen Farrell on the front of men's health, yeah. that's what I want to see. I want to see an England player on the front of men's health. What about Carl Fitzpatrick on front of men's health? Because you've lost loads <laughs> of weight lately, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> The Irish Times, maybe, well, actually, maybe not Menzel. We'll put the before and after pictures actually on yeah, the video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But no, that's it. It is. It, it, that, it would be fantastic to see that type of stuff. GQ magazine and um, you know the Men's Health magazine. It's got more mainstream. Of course, come more mainstream. Of course it, it is. And, 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 and do you know what, mate? The, the thing is, as well. Again, we're talking about buying from players here from a marketing perspective. But if you asked. A number of rugby league players would they pause on the front of men's health? They'd probably refuse to do it because they see it as embarrassing. And there's yeah. that cultural thing again is that I'm not standing at front of men's health showing off. But in rugby union, they understand there's a bit more of an education that this is what pays our wages. This yeah. exposure in turn creates more revenue, which means I get paid more money on the back of it. Yeah. And that's what I think where the education side needs to come in and um Luke, it's only since I've stepped away from rugby and I'm having a look at what goes on behind the scenes that I understand this this stuff now because I didn't as a player. You know, I didn't yeah. I didn't understand how hard they worked down there in that office yeah. to get the commercial side running and everything else. And then I couldn't be just turning up for a promotion or turning up ten minutes yeah, late. Do you know that. what I mean? I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, but but then again, it's there's, there's an educational thing around. Luke, guys, this is where our commercial team are at. This is what we need from you as players. We really need this buying because if you're saying to us that you want a 10% pay increase, yeah. then we we are asking that you give us 10% yeah, more yeah, effort. Yeah. So, you know, there's got to be buying from from, yeah. from the players as well. And I agree. And Luke, I can only say this with hindsight because I didn't give it as well. Yeah. I didn't understand the the importance of, of building a brand really. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, you're right. And some players do, some are great, some coaches are great. Do you know what I mean? Like Steve, obviously, we've got some stuff that we've done. He's he, he, He's been great with it. I mean, Justin Albrook at, at, at St. Helens, I was speaking yeah. to Justin. We did a did a joint press conference here <clears throat> at the week after we'd flown the plane above uh, the stadium. Do you know, loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. It gets people talking about the sport, it gets yeah. people interested in the game. One moment that always sticks out with Steve Price is when he picked Wolfie up and dumped him to the floor. Stage. Do you know what I mean? That was stage. Was yeah. it stage? I asked him yeah. before the game, said, Steve, don't worry about the game or the result, just make sure you tip Wolfie on his head. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. But 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 that you know that no, ad behaviour is it got a lot of exposure. You yeah, think yeah. about how many times that was shown on Sky. But Sky Sports Sky Sports did a montage on Wolfie. Did they? Did a montage on Wolfie. Did like yeah. two or three minutes on on all oh, his right. uh, escapades for, throughout the uh, throughout the year. Yeah. And again, it's piquing people's interest. It's getting our Warren Wolves brand exposure. Getting our partners exposure. Mm. 
just just through, just through the mascots uh, yeah. silly antics yeah and it, you know it, it's working for you at the minute you know you've, you've already spoke about the statistics about uva getting and your partners yeah we did so off the pre-pandemic we had what 12.5 percent increase on on attendances in a do you mean in season work wasn't fantastic on the field uh so yeah, it's we, we've had a, had a big success. There's a, there's a lot of work to do. Last a lot of work to do. Last question then before we finish. But do you see yourself as a club CEO, or do you see have you got future plans to maybe look at working at the head of of Super League to try and promote this game? Oh, not because sure. I often yeah. joke with you that you're the new Morris Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Morris Lindsay was absolute legend, wasn't he? For what he, certainly what he did for Wigan anyway. I'm not too sure what he did for other clubs, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, look. I'm, 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 first of all, I'm not sure if they would have me, but yeah, I think it's a very different. I think it's a very challenging role, mm-hmm. being the CEO of, of Super League or the RFL. And what do you mean, goodness, you, you're fighting some battles there on a mm-hmm. on a day to day basis. Uh, look, you never, you never say never, but I absolutely love it here at Warrington. Uh, love to meet the guys that the board of directors that that I work for are, are, are fantastic. But look, you never say never, but certainly not at this stage. I'd be I'd be looking to do do that role. I think it's. Uh, uh, it takes a certain person to go and do that that role. It's uh, it'll be very very challenging and uh, very different to Clubland. I think very different. It sounded like Brian Potter then Clubland. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, sunshine indoors. That's what I want to bring. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing: you don't want me doing is giving your time up for free to the Super League to to say I'll, I'll come and be the CEO for the free know, free wage yeah. for a couple of months to try and get it. your foot in the door. Yeah. Also, don't give me time up free for doing podcasts as well. So I'm paying for this. <laughs> um, anyway, what? <laughs> no, but Carl, thanks very much. Thanks for that, mate. It's been brilliant. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers.